What's up, dude? Over the years, I've spent a lot of time and money figuring out exactly what equipment deserves a permanent home in my kitchen. So I thought I would make this video as a guide for you on your own cooking journey so you don't waste your hard-earned money on brands or equipment that don't work well or won't last long. Let's get straight into it, and as always, there is no time to waste. Now let's go! Today, we'll be going over eight essential categories that will cover virtually all of your cooking needs. And I'll be taking you through literally every single piece of equipment I use to run my cooking show. And some of the equipment I'll be listing today is pretty expensive, which is why I figured out some budget options for you as well. After watching the video, just go down in the description underneath and you will see those budget options next to the expensive one. And today we're saving best for last, so if you're into knives at all, definitely stick around for that. Let's start the day with our first category of appliances. I have the trifecta of of equipment that I just can't live without. It's the three musketeers, it's the three amigos, it's the three blind mice, the blender, the KitchenAid stand mixer, and the food processor. Starting with the blender, and this one is a Vitamix, extremely powerful blender. As I said earlier, there will be a budget option down in the description because the major downside of this blender is it's expensive. Having said that, you get what you pay for when you buy a Vitamix. If you're trying to make something like a really smooth, silky soup, and you use a Vitamix blender, it is gonna get a texture that is unfricking believable. And in my own experience using cheaper blenders, they work pretty well, but they won't get that same kind of texture. Moving on here to the food processor. And this one is Cuisinart brand. I've had it for about two years at this point. It's an absolute workhorse of an appliance. I like it because it's pretty big. Certainly a great time saver in the kitchen for a lot of different uses. And what's good about food processors is you can replace that blade every couple years as you see fit. And hopefully by doing that, you can get at least a decade or more out of one piece of equipment. And last but certainly not least, I have the KitchenAid stand mixer, which comes with a whisk, a paddle, and a dough hook. I use this beast of a machine mostly for when I'm baking, especially things like creaming butter and sugar. I use it all the time for that. This is one of the cheaper models that doesn't have the most powerful motor. So I would say if you're gonna use this a lot for bread making, I would definitely opt for a more powerful motor. My friends, I'm all about buying equipment that may possibly last a lifetime. So I'm always gonna opt to spend a few more dollars and not replace something once every year or two years. Save money in the long run. If you do get a KitchenAid, a great bonus to have for this machine is all the attachments that you can put in right here. For instance, this meat grinder attachment, I use all the freaking time. I don't like to buy ground beef anymore. I use that. I make all my own ground beef. It's much better, much cheaper. On the other side, if you're into pasta making, you can also attach a pasta maker in there. It makes it really easy and fun to make fresh homemade pasta. Before moving on, here are two more appliances that are a little bit less essential, but I still really love and use all the time. The first being this Zojirushi rice cooker. Don't know if I'm saying that right, but this thing, honestly, I, I love it. Because the fact of the matter is, if you don't use a rice cooker, cooker, you will mess up your rice from time to time, but having one of these, it makes it perfectly every single time. I've even made a cheesecake in here, and recently I cooked a whole chicken in this thing, so it is for more than just rice. It also has this little steaming basket on top, so you could cook some vegetables or fish on top of the rice at the same time. The downside is this thing is definitely pretty pricey, but it is something I absolutely enjoy. Can you get a rice cooker that does the same thing for way cheaper? Yes, of course you can. We'll link one down in the description. Having said that, this thing f***ing rocks. On the other side here, I have a recent purchase, actually, a spice grinder, which I have certainly been putting to good use. And the only reason I got this one, I shopped around a little bit, I wanted to be able to detach the cup, like right here, to make for easy cleaning. This one also has two cups, one for spices or dry stuff, and another one with a different blade for wet items. I've been using this wet one a lot for garlic and ginger for Indian cooking, and it's been working out incredible. It saves me a lot of time mincing those aromatics another way. For our second category, we're moving on to cutting boards. And as you can see, I have a lot of them. And the one that resting on is also a cutting board, rather a butcher's block, which I use for all my cooking videos. You don't need this one, but if you are curious where I got it, I got it at Home Depot. On another note, you have your wood cutting boards. I have a bunch of different sizes, and when choosing wood cutting boards, thicker is almost always better. On the other side, I have a bunch of plastic boards. I use these mostly for meat and fish. Yes, you can cut meat and fish on your wood cutting board, I suppose, if you want to, but for me, just keeping things really sanitary, I prefer plastic. All these plastic ones are from a restaurant supply store called Webstrong, which is 
an incredible place for you to buy equipment, tools, all kinds of stuff. Actually, quite a few items you'll be seeing today are from the Webstron store. Full disclosure, I have no affiliation with that store. It is just something I know about and use all the time. The only tip I can leave you with about ordering from that store is to put in a big order because you're gonna pay shipping. Now, almost more importantly than the cutting boards is how you stick them down. If you're using a cutting board without anything, it's just gonna slide all over the place. I would never, never do that. I have a couple options. The first is these little stickies. You just pop them off, stick them to the four corners underneath your cutting board, and they will literally stay there for months on end before having to replace them. The other option is these little rubber feet. They won't stick down, but you just slide them under your cutting board and they'll stick it down. That's what I have underneath this huge butcher's block right there, and it works great. Personally, when it comes to cutting boards, I always prefer bigger ones, obviously, because my whole table is a cutting board, and I would always get something around this size, anything smaller. It's not really for me, but again, that's just personal preference. Next up, let's head outside for a little detour into the world of grilling. Let's start with this big old Ironwood 885 Traeger grill, which by the way, in full disclosure, the company just sent that to me completely for free. Would I buy one if not? I don't know, maybe. It depends on how much money I had, really. It's a pellet grill. You simply load up the box on the side with wood pellets, which makes it a really convenient way to just smoke some meat. I actually like the Traeger grill for smoking meat. I do not like it for high heat grilling. I find the whole thing just smokes up like crazy and gives my food some bad flavor. But at low temperatures and for smoking, again, it's pretty good. I would say you can't compare any pellet smoker to smoking meat the old fashioned way with hard wood. It's just infinitely better. Having said that, Traeger's still pretty good. Moving on to the grill I got recently, the slow and sear kettle grill. And this grill came recommended from Guga Foods and that's the grill he definitely uses the most on his channel. And for full disclosure, I am affiliated with this company. Having said that, I do honestly love this grill and have been using it a lot. It's been great for high heat grilling and having that designated hot zone and cold zone complete with the spinning grate, it's such a blessing for when you get flare ups because you can just get the meat out of the way instantly. And if you wanna smoke some meat, this thing holds its temperature extremely well. What I also love is my grill blazer grill gun. Let's call it what it is. It's a flamethrower. And that is another recommendation that comes from Guga. It's what you use to start up your coals. So instead of it taking 15, 20 minutes using a chimney, you can now literally do it in three or four minutes and feel like a complete badass while doing it. Personally, I have a love for fire. I've been a chef my whole life. I mean, it makes sense. And using these guns has been an absolute joy. I have both the sous vide gun for indoor use, creme brulees, blow torching meat, etc., and the outdoor grill gun for lighting up my coals. A few more grilling pieces I love here. I'm not sure what these call, but these are like the Turkish style kebabs. You can smash a bunch of ground meat on here. You can do big pieces of meat and it's just fun to grill them over the coals like this side to side. And obviously you can use wooden skewers, but having some metal meat skewers like this is just super handy. They're never gonna burn and fall apart while you're grilling. Must have for me. Moving on, something that's actually pretty important to me and that's storage. And to be very honest with you, my favorite storage items are these quart containers. They come in a full quart, half quart, and quarter quart. They're cheap, they're reusable. You can clean them out, throw them in the dishwasher, whatever. And just to have these three sizes for home cooking is absolutely incredible. They just come with simple lids. You snap it on, label them up if you want with some masking tape and happy days, my friends. Honestly, quart containers, I've reordered these a bunch of times. After a while, they will get old and start to crack, but they last quite a long time. I just look for BPA free ones, which these are. And then not that you need these ones, but I like these four quart containers. If I'm doing bigger cooking projects, if I make some soup, whatever, stocks, braises, these are always good. As well as these smaller two quart ones also come in handy. From time to time, I'll use a bigger eight quart one for certain items as well. And last but certainly not least, a little bit more expensive but really good Tupperware is Snapware. Not affiliated with them, I just like that these things snap on, you can drop them, they will never spill. It's made out of Pyrex as well, which is a huge bonus. Comes in lots of different shapes and sizes, it's just good Tupperware. You don't wanna get the amounts wrong, my friends. For our next category, we're moving on to measurements. Pretty easy category, my friends, starting over here with some measuring cups. And I like to have a bunch of different sizes. This one's an eight cup KitchenAid brand. I like it because it's light. The rest are Pyrex, I have one in four cups cups, two cups, and one cup. And just AKA, these are for liquids, these are for dry ingredients. Sometimes people get that mixed up. And these ones for dry ingredients, I actually found those on Etsy. I have a few things from Etsy. Etsy is actually a lot of fun, albeit a bit more expensive. You can find really cool items like these measuring cups on there. They just look awesome. And of course, if you're doing any kind of baking, I highly suggest you get a digital scale. And I also highly suggest you follow recipes that are in grand. So you can recreate something perfectly without using this stupid cup system. And the reason 
reason it's stupid because if you fill up a cup with flour and one person packs it down and the other person doesn't, it's gonna be a drastically different amount. When you're following the grand system, 180 grams is 180 grams and so forth. You'll never make a mistake that way recreating a recipe. Gram system is better. You can also use that for ounces and whatnot. My friends, I'm really excited to present to you a gem that I poured my heart and soul into for the last year. Master in the Making is an ebook that contains 55 carefully selected winning recipes that I can guarantee you're gonna love. And I truly believe this book is the perfect handbook for any serious home cook that's looking to improve their skills and boost their confidence in the kitchen. The link will be in the description underneath this video if you wanna check it out. Moving forward, and this is a big one, our next category is pots and pans. And what you see before you, my friends, is essentially all the pans I use cooking on this channel. They're all here, this is it. This is everything I use. Starting over here with the La Cruce, La Cruce, however you say it, it's French. These kind of Dutch oven type pots, I love for braising meat. Stews, braises, slow cooking, things like that. However, I don't like them at all for searing meat. I find the sides of the pot get really dirty before the meat even gets browned. I don't know, something weird about searing meat in these pots. Having said that, they hold their heat really well, so back to the whole braising thing, they're good for that. Moving on, one of the main brands I use is Made in Cookware, no affiliation. I wish I had taken better care of this pan. It's a non-stick pan. It still works really well, but it has a few little scratches on it. I've had it for a while at this point. I'll still like cook meat or fish in this thing. and It'll work really well. And I like that it's big. Next up, you have your typical cast iron pan. This one's a La Crusade, but you do not need to spend a bunch of money to get a good cast iron pan. Just buy one from like Lodge or something like that. You could get a pan like this for probably 20 bucks. It will literally last a lifetime. You could use this thing to defend your home. It's a, it's a weapon. And in terms of being able to get a really good sear on a steak and without having to spend a lot of money on a more expensive pan, cast iron is definitely the way to go. Downside to cast iron, it's heavy. So for me, I've got a plate of metal in my wrist and it will get really sore if I keep handling these pans without getting two hands on it. Something to note if you have any kind of wrist problems like me. Here's a little pan I absolutely freaking love and I've used it so, so much. This one's also from Webstaurant Store. It's just a little eight inch nonstick omelet pan. And I absolutely freaking love this thing for a lot more than just eggs, although eggs is what I use it for the most. It has this little guard that comes off and on. It can go in the oven, which is also pretty cool. The only downside to this one is this little rubber guard, which I love slides off pretty easily. So I'm sure there's probably a way to fix that and stick it on more, but it's something to know. Great little pan, love it. Next up, and this is a kind of a controversial one, is this grill pan. I actually really love a grill pan. You've seen me cook chicken in this thing a bunch of times if you watch this channel. It's cast iron, it's inexpensive, and it does a really good job for cooking meat indoors. Next up, a couple of workhorse steel pans. These are just 12 inch saute pans. One is D5 all clad, one is made in cookware. Two amazing pans, these things definitely aren't cheap, but they will last a lifetime. This D5 is definitely more expensive because it's got five layers of copper and steel, so it's ultra conductive to heat, meaning it will heat heat up and cool down extremely quickly. This one heats up and cools down a little slower than the D5, but also extremely good pan. I also have another big stainless steel pan in case I'm doing something a little bigger that's not gonna fit in one of those smaller ones. I like to have one of these on hand. I forget the exact brand this one is from, but I will post it down in the description. Next up, just your standard pot for boiling pasta, or braising something, making a stew, making a soup, or whatever. You need one of these, right? This one's from Made In. I'm sure there are definitely cheaper options out there, but this one has served me well. Next up, a little saucepan. Sometimes you just wanna heat up a very little amount of something, that's why I bought this. And it also has this curved lip of an edge, so when you pour some sauce out, it doesn't dribble down the side of the pot, really useful. Another small pot I use mostly as a saucepan from La Crusade. Works great, pretty standard stuff. And last, but certainly not least, probably my favorite item here, at least one of them, is this wok, which I dug deep down into the pits of Amazon to find. If you're doing a lot of Asian cooking at home, having a good wok is absolutely a must. It's a carbon steel wok made out of one piece of metal, hand hammered, with this very simple kind of handle on here. I'll link a video down in the description of how I seasoned this wok when it arrived. I don't know what to say, this thing is super non-stick. I absolutely love cooking out of it. When I'm done with it, I just wipe it out and rub a little more oil into it if necessary and it's good to go. The one downside I could say about this wok is I wish the handle was just a little bit longer. Having said that, I still absolutely love it. Next up, and this is a big one as we're gonna cover quite a few items, kitchen tools. All right, my friends, here is the gist of all the kitchen tools I use on a frequent basis. Obviously, I use some more than others, but each and every single one of these tools deserves a spot in my kitchen. Uh, let's get started. <laughs> Over here, a couple of rubber spatulas, rubber made spatulas. You can judge any chef by how well he cleans out a bolt using one of these. Very self-explanatory, couple of wooden tools for those non-stick pans and stuff like risotto. Some balloon whisks, I like to have one little one, one bigger one, different purpose. 
purposes. Microplane, this is something people hear me bang on about all the freaking time. Using these is a really easy way to get a fine snow-like texture out of things like Parmesan cheese, lemon zest, and for garlic and ginger, it will mince it into a literal fine paste. It's a cheap tool, I always have one in my drawer, and I replace it every three to four months to keep it sharp. Couple of tongs, these shorter ones I use mostly for indoor cooking, and when I'm outside using the grill, you gotta have some long tongs like this so you don't burn your hands. These! God, I freaking love these things. If you don't know what they are, it's called an offset spatula. And in the culinary world, they're mostly used for desserts, pastry, things like that. Spreading the icing on a cake, right? But what I use them for is very different. It's almost like a little mini spatula. I use it to turn meat in the pan. Whether I'm cooking scallops, fish, or any other cut of meat, these things come in handy all the time. Good old slotted fish spatula like this. You gotta have one of these. Scoop up the fish, the oil drains out the bottom. It's a must have as well. Little Michelin star tweezers, which you don't need, but they can be nice when you're doing some some sort of fine detailed work where you want to plate something and not destroy it with your big hot dog hands, which is what I have. Pastry brush, you're making beef wellington, you're making egg wash, you're brushing it onto pastry, whatever. Gotta have a pastry brush. I also use this a lot when I'm braising meat by dipping it in water and cleaning up the edges of the pan as it reduces. That way you're not left with all that disgusting crud on the side of the pot, making for a harder cleanup, plus that's flavor that belongs in your food. A peeler is next, and this is a very simple one. This is the kind I like to use. I just prefer this shape of peeler to the other one. Next, we have some digital thermometers and I like to go for the ones that have a really thin metal section so I don't put big holes in my meat. This one is called a Thermopop. It's a good brand. I like it for that reason. This one is arguably a little bit less essential maybe for a home cook. Although if you're working in a restaurant as a cook and you don't have a set of ring molds, that's one thing you gotta have. Just different size little molds like this made out of metal so you can cut out pastries, even things like vegetables. It's also used a lot for plating to get that perfect circle of food on a plate. Next up, a couple of dough scrapers or bench scrapers. These are technically for portioning out dough, but what I use them for is to scrape all the food off my cutting board when doing prep. It's just a really easy way to get all the food in one place and then put it on top to move it into a receptacle. Spoons. I'm not going to go too heavy into spoons, but if you're a cook or a chef, you're obsessed with spoons. It's just, uh, it's just a natural way of life. I use them for stirring. I use them for plating food. I like the slotted ones for draining out things that might have oil or too much dressing. My two cents for spoons is to hit up some thrift shops, see if you can find some cool ones. Rolling pin goes without saying you need a freaking rolling pin, okay? This one is all right. I would be a little bit happier with a bigger head heavier one. Arguably a little bit more non-essential as well, unless you're a professional cook, melon baller. It's just a classic tool to have in your bag, my friends. It just cuts out little circles of food from whatever. It doesn't have to be a melon. Kitchen shears. These ones are from OXO. Maybe you're cutting out the spine of a chicken. Maybe you're taking the scales off of a whole fish. You need these in your bag. And I like the ones that come apart like this for easy cleaning. I could even sharpen them this way if I want. Butcher's twine in case you need to tie up a piece of meat or a roast or truss a chicken or what have you. Box grater. If you want to grate some cheese, grate some carrots, grate some vegetables, you need one. Funnel, when I'm straining out oil after doing a frying session, or if I want to put vinaigrette into a squeeze bottle, it has a multitude of uses. It's a funnel. Meat pounder, I like this one. From KitchenAid, I just wish it was a little bit heavier. This is definitely an essential one for me. This is a ricer. Comes with a bunch of different settings by twisting this part right here. If you want to make some silken, like beautiful textured mashed potatoes, you need something like a ricer. Couple of spiders, if you're blanching food or you're frying something in oil, that's just a really easy way to get the food out while leaving the oil in the pot. A strainer, do I need to explain this? It strains. These little lemon and lime juicers I use all the time if I'm doing a bunch of citrus, say I want to make ceviche or something, and save the pain from my hands and wrists. Bowls! Have a bunch of different sizes for a bunch of different reasons. I have a little tiny one. I have a freaking huge one. And last but certainly not least, one of my favorite kitchen tools ever, the mandolin. I tell people all the time this can give you professional chef level cuts without having to be a professional. I've been cooking for 20 years. I'm pretty darn consistent with a knife, but I will never be as consistent as this mandolin. It's very simple. There's a razor sharp blade there. You twist a little knob on the back, which drops this shelf, exposing the blade, and you can just shave anything on there and get perfect slices. Cucumbers, carrots, potatoes, whatever, what have you, you can use a mandolin to slice it up. Before we we get to our last category, here are a few honorable mentions. These are things you certainly don't need, but are pretty awesome to have. And one of them makes me grin ear to ear. First up, for some reason, I bought this Vac Master, right? You really don't need one of these. It's like a thousand dollar piece of equipment. <laughs> but working in restaurants my whole life, I always loved using these exact Vac Masters. And so when I'm using this thing, I'm just grinning ear to ear because I just have a lot of fun with it. And I use it to store braises, meat, stock, so I can get everything super flat like that. I can also use it to make instant pickles 
cells as it literally breaks down the cell walls of vegetables. There are two kinds. One works with air and one works with oil. I chose the oil one because it runs a little bit quieter, but both are fine. And when you combine this machine with its faithful partner, an immersion circulator, which is basically this small device you put into a vessel of water, well, then you have a really cool setup for doing sous vide cooking. Finally, this glorious Breville espresso machine. For all you coffee enthusiasts out there, this thing is pretty awesome. I use it obviously to make espresso and foam milk and just for getting instant hot water out of is pretty nice. It's definitely something my wife and I have put to really good use over the last three years. And if there's one thing you absolutely should not buy, it's this stupid toaster. I don't know why I spent a couple hundred dollars on this toaster. Okay, yeah, it has a digital display and it does a pretty decent job. Oh yeah, and guess what it does? Makes toast, just like any other toaster would do. It's just unnecessary to spend that much money on a toaster. And last but certainly not least, as mentioned in the beginning of this video, I'm gonna go over my most used knives. And here we are, my friend. If you've made it this far into the video, congratulations. It means you really care about cooking equipment, which also means you really care about cooking, so you're definitely a cool person. We finally made it to knives, and full disclosure, I do not not, do not work with the company where I get most of my knives. It's called JapaneseChefsKnife.com. I will put a link to that website in the description. It is just my preferred place to get my knives. In terms of what you pay versus what you get, it's really incredible and their selection is off the charts. Now, while I do have a lot more knives than this, these are the six essential knives I would start with. With number one obviously being the chef's knife. This one I get a ton of comments about and it is from that website I mentioned. And this is the one you splurge on, right? Me as someone who's loved cooking my whole life, life. I can justify spending the money on a knife like this, although I wouldn't do it all the time. This one costs about $400 and it's awesome. It's basically a Japanese style knife made for the Western hand, which that website has a lot of these kind of Western style Japanese knives. Balance is incredible. The weight is amazing. A knife like this is just an absolute joy to use. But bottom line is start with a chef's knife, right? I will put some budget options down in the description. For instance, my older brother who worked at one and two Michelin star restaurants, all he uses are Mac knives, which is a great budget option. These are some other different style chef's knives from the same website. Now, if I had to choose just a two knife kit, it would be the chef's knife and a bread knife. I cannot go without a bread knife. You can do so much with this besides just bread. It's really a must have knife for me. For instance, I will use a bread knife for tomatoes. I'll use it to take the peels off of certain vegetables and many other things. It's just a very handy knife to have. This one is a Tojiro and it's the bread knife I've been using for the last say five, six, seven years. I don't know, a long time now. It's an absolute workhorse of a bread knife. This one you actually get on Amazon. Next up, we'll move into four more knives that are a little bit more non-essential. However, these should be the knives you fill in with your kit after you get those first two. Starting with a good slicer. If I want to get really thin slices of anything, I'm using a slicer. This is a carbon steel slicer I've had for quite a few years now. I'll use this thing to take the skin off a of fish. I'll use this thing to clean up a piece of beef tenderloin, say to get off all the excess fat and silver skin. I'll use it to prep fish and many other things. A slicer is a key knife for me. Let's see. Next up, I would have to choose a cleaver. If I'm hacking up some chicken bones or cutting through bone in any kind of way, fish, poultry, or otherwise, there's no way I'm using one of my nice chef knives for that. You need a cleaver as part of your kit. I also use this Deba knife, kind of like a cleaver. This is a Japanese knife that is actually meant to chop the heads off a small fish. It's sharp mostly on just this one side, although I use this much like I would use a cleaver. For the fifth knife, I would choose a paring knife. Any kind of little detailed work, peeling vegetables in your hands, making small little finesse cuts, you definitely want to have a paring knife in your kit. For the sixth knife, I would be choosing a utility knife. These are knives about this size. This is a little bit small, I think, for a utility knife. But if I want to say brunoise a shallot, which means get a really, really, really small fine dice, I would be using something like a utility knife. And as a seventh honorable mention, a boning knife. One that has a lot of flex to it like this. You use this for filleting fish, cleaning up meat, and all kinds of work. I obviously use my slicer as well, and I use this sometimes for certain preparation. I'm not gonna get too into this right now, but Japanese whetstones are what I use to sharpen my knives. If you're looking for a good place to start, just get a thousand grit stone, which I'll have linked below. However, as time goes on and you expand your kit, you're gonna wanna get different grits. Here I have a 400, 800, 1000, and on here is a 1,000, 4,000 dual-sided stone. So briefly, if I had a knife that was completely dull, I would take it to the 400, then the 800, then the 1,000, then the 4,000, and then to keep it sharp as time went along, I would just use one of these steel rods that doesn't sharpen the blade, it's just maintaining the edge you got from the stones, right? And so before I use my knives, I just give it a quick, maybe like 10 strokes on here, just to maintain that edge I got from the stones. And that's it for now, my friends. Obviously, the world of knives is much more vast, but if you're looking for a place to start, I would recommend those six. Again, there's links to all the websites I mentioned in this video, as well as all the tools that are available on Amazon down in the description. And next to them, you will find the budget options for all the expensive equipment. Thanks for hanging out with me today. And until next time, you know I love you in the mouth.